Woodpecker tour today. Um, if this is your first time Zooming, it does take a little playing with, um, and I just wanna point out that your video should be off because it helps the technology run a little smoother. And please also keep your audio off. Uh, these can both be done if you move your mouse to the bottom of your screen and just make sure the microphone and camera icons both have a red line across them. I'm sure by now everybody's been Zooming for months on end now. <laughs> you probably know this platform pretty well. So here's what your screen may have looked like when you first came into the meeting. So when I'm in full screen, your screen probably is as well. If you need to exit at any point and do other things on your computer, um, just push escape on your computer um, or push exit full screen. And at the bottom of your window, you'll see the chat button, which I have circled in green on my presentation window. Um, click that chat button and that should dock the chat right next to the presentation so that you can see what people are saying so that you can chat messages to us. And just make sure that when you do chat a message, um, make sure it says everyone instead of to an individual person so that we can all see your input. Perfect. So I mentioned before, my name is Chaley Jensen. I'm the Nebraska Wildlife Education Coordinator for Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. And I'm based out of the Bird Conservancy Education Office in Scottsbluff, Nebraska, about three hours northeast of Denver. I work in conjunction with Game and Parks, and my programs are paid for by Nebraska Environmental Trust. Joining me in the chat window today is Kelsey Mazur. She is the volunteer coordinator for Bird Conservancy, and she's based in Brighton, Colorado. So if you have any questions during this webinar, please type them into the chat window, and Kelsey or Tyler will be there to answer those for you. Today, my favorite woodpecker is the Northern Flicker, a gorgeous but kind of annoying woodpecker. Kelsey is loving the pileated woodpecker, one of our largest living woodpeckers in North America. So I mentioned this webinar is presented by Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Our mission is to conserve birds in their Shaylee, I think we lost your audio. Okay, well, I'll continue and tell you a little bit about Bird Conservancy while um, Shaylee figures out her sound. Um, we aim to conserve birds and their habitats through science, stewardship, and education. So our science team is out there doing um, monitoring and things like that. Our stewardship team works directly with landowners to make sure their land is a good habitat for um, birds as well as profitable for them. And our education team, which Chaley and I are a part of, um, we work to share nature and um, the love of birds with everybody in our community. Um, we'll give Chaley just a minute to hopefully um, <laughs> share her screen again. If not, um, we'll, we'll get it sorted. We can just have a nice conversation about <laughs> woodpeckers. So, um, if you have any questions before we get started, feel free to type them into the chat and we can do our best to answer them for you. Hi to everyone. Uh, my name's Tyler. I've been kind of in the back scenes with everyone. Uh, so while we're waiting, um, if you can please type into the chat window uh, where you're zooming from, uh, so where you are right now, uh, how many people you're watching with, and then what is your favorite bird today? Uh, we'll get that out of the way, and I'm sure Chaley will join us uh, soon. That is a great question, Zach, and I think we'll get to that very soon. Always wanted to see an acorn woodpecker, Mike and Stephanie. They're so cool. I love their granary trees.
such a variety of favorite birds today. I love it. <laughs> How about them whooping cranes? They're pretty cool. <laughs> Wish we had more of them here. Uh, I just heard from, from Chaley and I guess her internet completely went out, uh, oh, which no. is pretty bad timing. I asked if she could send me her presentation. Um, so hopefully we'll get that back up uh, running as soon as we can. Um, but I love everyone's answers. I fully, uh, William said that if, the, if we ever find the ivory build woodpecker, <laughs> That would be his favorite woodpecker. Um, oh, awesome. There we go. I have the presentation, Tyler. So if um, you'd like me to go ahead and click through, I can do that. OK. Hopefully, you're all answering that question in the chat right now. Let's get started. Okay, so today we'll be talking about all the different kinds of woodpeckers all across North America, just because um, we have so many people joining us from so many different places. Um, woodpeckers are part of the Picidae family, um, meaning that this whole family of these various birds all share very similar adaptations and are in the same group. Um, we'll talk about different habitat preferences and adaptations. Um, where these woodpeckers like to live, um, how they are best adapted for being a woodpecker. Um, we'll also look at um, different woodpeckers all across North America, as well as some tips on how to identify those. And William, I see your ivory-billed woodpecker is on this slide, so you're, you're doing great. Um, okay. All right. Oh, sorry. All right. So, our Picidae family includes woodpeckers, sapsuckers, piculates. Oh my, so many different kinds of birds. What are some things that could make woodpeckers, sapsuckers, and piculates all similar? Does anyone have any ideas they feel like sharing in the chat? Yeah. Well, we can say what we know about woodpeckers is that they are <laughs> woodpeckers, right? They have their beak, absolutely, and how they eat. Um, yes, so woodpeckers, if we look at this picture, they all have kind of that more um, sturdy looking bill, a little broader at the front and pointed that helps them actually, you know, peck the trees. Um, yeah, beets. Feet, bills, feet, coloration, pecking for insects, hard-headed, brilliant. They also have similar shape. If we look at this picture here, they're all kind of shaped um, similarly. They kind of have that upright um, shape where they're able to, you know, climb the trees. Um, I see some people mentioning their feet. Um, yes, they have very specially adapted feet that let them climb very easily to be a woodpecker. Absolutely, and they all have very hard heads to help them um, withstand the, the pecking of those trees. Um, and when they are pecking those trees, they're going ahead and um, looking for insects, actually. They're not just pecking on your wooden buildings to be <laughs> annoying, though it can be, but they're looking for insects between the bark and the wood of the tree, which is pretty cool. All right, I'm going to pause for a moment. Um, and it looks like Chaley is back. Um, so if you give me just one second, we'll switch over to Chaley. Okay. Thank you for bearing with us. I really appreciate it. Here we are. Oh my gosh, I'm back. <laughs> so that has never happened to us before, but that is one of the reasons we have three people who work for Bird Conservancy 
in this meeting with us, making sure we don't have techno technological issues. Thank you, Kelsey, so, so much. You're amazing. So we've talked about this. It was actually perfect timing that my internet cut out right as I asked where you came from and you had some time to chat in where you came from today, how many people are with you and what your favorite birds are. So I'm just really quick gonna switch to my presenter view. Here we go. All right, so I believe Kelsey went over that slide and that slide. So let's talk now about woodpecker habitat. Um, as maybe many of us know, or maybe few of us know, habitat consists of four different things. Every living thing on earth needs these four components in their habitat in order to survive. And they need a lot of those components. So let's think about what these four components would be for the woodpeckers. The first one is food. And Kelsey mentioned a couple different things that woodpeckers eat. What is that? Will you type it into the chat? Insects, beetles, yep, definitely. Seeds. If maybe you have suet feeders at your house or certain types of of uh, bird seed feeders, what some woodpeckers do like the, the seeds. Do um, woodpeckers eat any larger animals that are not insects? So maybe frogs or toads, anything like that? So it is mostly invertebrates. Um, our woodpeckers are going to eat basically just insects, occasionally seeds, and they are, some are called sap suckers. They're still considered woodpeckers, but they actually like to lick sap out of these holes in these trees that they live at. So for their water, where do woodpeckers get water from? In their habitats. Great Definitely. Answers, everyone. Yeah, really good answers. Do you think that they would be able to get any water from their food sources? Think about the two or three main food sources we mentioned. Is there water in any of those and could they get water from those things? <laughs> yeah, I'll give you an interesting fact about the sap and the insects. Sap is quite liquidy, especially if it's a little warmed up. It consists of a high amount of water and insects also consist of, a, well, a small amount of water per insect. But if you're a woodpecker eating hundreds of bugs per day, you do get some water from that food source, from those insects and then maybe you wouldn't have to visit the bird baths as much. I'm sure they still do. They do still want to preen their feathers and clean off, get a little bit of drink from that water source. All right, and what, where do woodpeckers live? What kind of habitat are they looking to find? Um, you could be thinking of where in the world they live or what they're looking for in that place that they live. These two pictures have some good representation. <laughs> Yep. No, very good. And I love that you're, a lot of you are bringing up the snags, this soft wood. The two trees on the picture on the right are called snags. And that just means a standing dead tree that has a lot of life in it. How these trees get all of this life in there is, well, when the tree is living, it has life in it. You know, there may be insects that live in that tree already. There's microorganisms that already live in that tree. It's got its own ecosystem. When more insects come in and start rot eating away at that wood inside that tree that has recently died, that's going to attract more, larger insects. It's going to attract larger animals that eat insects and so on and so on. So we've got a really complicated food web in each of these single snags. 
one thing as a conservation professional, we're always talking about these snags and how important it is that they remain standing and don't get removed. Now, when you're looking at snags in an area like this where there's no, there's no development in this photo, it's a beautiful, serene outdoor area. These trees don't really pose any problem, but maybe this is something you're considering spending money to remove a dead tree from where you live. Of course, safety is the most important thing, but perhaps, it's, perhaps you'd be able to just leave part of the tree with the roots intact in the ground because that tree, it will, while it remains standing, it's not going to decompose as fast and it's going to keep providing habitat for not just woodpeckers, literally hundreds of animals throughout the year. So on the left picture, we see that's actually a utility pole. And I wanted to bring this up today too. We'll definitely talk about the damage that wood, woodpeckers can inflict later on. But these are the type of holes that they'll either be drilling or they'll be, those holes had been there for a long time and that's where they're looking for bugs. These are called cavities, which just means holes. Oh, and saguaros, perfect. Yeah, so there are some woodpeckers that live in strictly a desert environment and we'll talk about a couple of those later. But they, sometimes those saguaros have holes in them already or the woodpeckers can easily, easily get into there since it's pretty soft. Awesome. I know we guys talked a little bit about adaptations. I'm not sure if we went through this slide yet. So I'm gonna scroll up in the chat. I think that I saw a lot. Yeah, I'm gonna go through and we can go through these pretty quickly since you already talked about them. So they have stiff tail feathers. If you look at the pictures of all of these woodpeckers, they almost all are pushing their bottoms of their tail feathers on the tree. It's because those tail feathers are very stiff and it's grouped together so that they can push on the tree with the bottom of their tail and stay upright. We'll talk more about what this term means, but they have zygodactyl feet. If you can see their feet in any of those pictures, find what you notice, especially if you have come to any other Bird Conservancy webinars. We often talk about the position of our bird's toes, depending on what group we're talking about that day. They have long, thick talons. So their talons are longer and stronger than most birds. They have a really long tongue. And we'll be talking about more of the reasons why or why these are very special adaptations for them. They drum on trees. They have a reinforced skull, a long beak. Most of them are insectivores or they're sap eaters. And some migrate, not all woodpeckers migrate. In fact, fewer uh, migrate than don't migrate. All right. So like I said, we always get into toe arrangement when we're talking about birds. So why would that even be important? What I want you to do for me is look down at your hands. Which finger of your five fingers helps you the most with grabbing and grasping things with your whole hand? Type in the chat what you think. Thumbs up for that one, haha, <laughs> that was a silly joke. Did you say thumb? <laughs> well, most birds have a toe arrangement kind of like our hands. Of course, they have ju just four toes, not five digits like us, but they have three pointing one direction and the other able to hook around the back and grasp onto things. Imagine like you're grabbing on the monkey bars. This is called anisodactyl. On the other end of the spectrum, you can have another toe arrangement, which is called zygodactyl. Most woodpeckers have this arrangement. So they have two toes pointing forward and two pointing backwards. So I wanna talk about their stiff tail feathers a little bit more and we'll see how these two adaptations work together for these birds. Zach, I see you have an awesome question and I'm gonna, I'm gonna address that in just a second, okay? That's an awesome question. So when you're watching woodpeckers outside, they're usually standing on the tree in the same position, no matter what the species are. So the bird on the left is pushing down with his tail feathers and grabbing on with his toes. It kind of looks like he's taking a nap on that, <laughs> on that tree, kind of cute. 
The one on the on the left is also pushing down with those stiff tail feathers. And do you see the two toes on top, two on bottom? So now that we know they have very stiff tails and long talons with zygodactyl feet, can anybody write into the chat just a short little phrase of how those things work together to help them stay on the tree? Exactly. I like that. Three points of contact. So if you were, let's say, if you would, um, would recognize a brown creeper or a red-breasted nuthatch, they also bounce along the tree in the same way that woodpeckers do. The brown creeper and nuthatches are a lot smaller than the woodpeckers usually, and they don't have those stiff tail feathers, and they don't have zygodactyl feet. The brown creeper kind of just is able to stay on with that light body weight, while the nuthatch actually flips its whole body upside down. That's why we have another name for them with but you know their butts in the air, and they hop and down that way. So they're upside down on the tree. And I like that Donna said, like rock climbing, three points on the rock. I, <laughs> I completely agree. That's the most stable you can be is those three points. If you have just an arm and a leg grabbing on that's not as stable from anyone that's done that before. You might, you might recognize that. Our woodpeckers are exactly the same way. So they're stabilizing themselves on, onto the tree. Also, they're a much, they're a little bit heavier of a bird compared to our smaller passerines, and they would need something to give them a little bit more stability on the tree. Awesome. All right, here we go. Zach had an amazing question. And I've had this question about woodpeckers for a long time too. This is one of the most fascinating things about birds in my humble opinion. So if you hit your head against a tree trunk all day, you probably would not feel too good <laughs> and neither would your brain. You actually could get hurt doing that. You could get very seriously hurt doing that. But woodpeckers do this all the time, basically day in and day out. That's what they're named for. So in 2011, researchers Wang and Chung et al looked specifically at this question. We're gonna look at some sciencey kind of pictures and try to see the difference in a woodpecker versus a different kind of bird, okay? So on the top black and gray photos on this slide, we are looking at a woodpecker skull on the left and a Eurasian hoopoe on the right. So some of us may be trained scientists or physicians and could tell you what's going on with a really good scientific explanation, but we want to just look and see the difference and how that would compare and help the woodpeckers avoid headaches. So what do you see in the picture labeled C versus D? Remember C is the woodpecker. We're looking at basically the front of their forehead, a cross section of the front of their forehead. Yeah, so it's more dense. Why would that help the woodpecker? They're, the bones in their skull are, most, I mean, like we've talked about in past webinars, most birds' bones are hollow. We can see here, this is also the case, but it's almost as if the woodpecker's skull is less hollow than the other bird. Yeah, it absorbs shock much better. So it's not going to get hurt as easy. These are great answers. I like that we're able to make these observations just by a picture and make conclusions based on what we think and what we see. So have you ever ridden in a car or on a bike with shocks? Um, if, you're not, if you're not familiar with those, these just make a bumpy ride much smoother. It helps absorb the impact. 
So woodpecker's heads are kind of like bike shocks for their brains. Now, if we look at the two blue pictures on the bottom, we see a picture of a woodpecker skull on the right labeled A, on the left, sorry, and two hyoid bones on the right. Hyoid is spelled H-Y-O-I-D. Now this bone typically goes under the jaw area for the bill of our birds. Most, I mean, all birds have a hyoid, but the one that's labeled B is our woodpecker's hyoid. It's almost a heart shape. And it actually, it's a little bit hard to tell on that picture, but it lifts up and it doesn't just go around the base of their skull. It goes from the bottom of their jaw, wraps around their chin to the back of their head, all the way up till it almost reaches their bill in the front of their head again. And this bone is bouncy, it's pliable, and it's like a seat belt for their brain. Um, it helps them not get these headaches or concussions from too much pecking. So I'm sure a lot of us have known about woodpeckers. We've seen woodpeckers on TV. We've seen them in real life. And we know that they just constantly drum and drum and drum. It's really important that they, they have these adaptations so that they can continue to live like that. They're adapted to live on the trees, hopping up and down, drumming through the bark to get insects out of the tree or drumming through the holes that are already there, licking around. And if they didn't have a special skull adaptation, do you think that these birds would be so successful or would they have to find another way to get food? What do you think? So to connect with humans a little bit, if anyone has unfortunately got a concussion or these things like are very possible for humans, that's from our brain basically bouncing around the inside of our skull and it can cause swelling, it can cause bruising, and that gives you a really foggy state of mind for it can be days after. So obviously that would not be good for a woodpecker if it was constantly just, oh, my head hurts so bad. They would definitely have to change how they get food if this wasn't a function of their body. So using this information, these scientists that studied this topic, and it's not just this one paper that discovered that they have special hyoid bones. In my opinion, this was just a very, um, it encompassed a lot of information about, about it. So what, what they also said was that they're using this information to better understand woodpeckers, but not only woodpeckers, they wanna understand humans better too. So Tyler mentioned football helmets. The NFL has worked with scientists who studied woodpeckers to make sure that people who play professional football, that their heads are protected as much as possible. Bike helmets, the same thing. Vehicle safety measurements, the same thing. I'm sure a lot of, a lot of um, woodpecker inspiration has been found in engineering. They're so specially adapted. And I could talk about adaptations for our whole hour, but I do want to get to, get to talking about the, the birds themselves too. Let's talk a little bit more about their heads, and then we will move on to some IDing of these woodpeckers. Okay, here we've got another odd picture. This is a pileated woodpecker, and on the top is a diagram showing that hyoid bone and the tongue. So do you see how it starts at the bottom of, of the chin where the bill meets the neck? and goes around the back of the head between their eyes and ends at the tip of the bill. That's where their tongue fits. It's, it fits especially in with, within that groove. So not only do they have a super long tongue, the longest I think in a woodpecker is a four inch tongue, four inches. <laughs> it also is barbed on the end. If you look closely, you can see a couple of like, it looks almost like a screw on the end, but it's got like a, like sort of like a fish hook. You know, it's got hooks on it. The tongue is also sticky. So they have these three very unique adaptations just on their tongue. It sticks, it's barbed, and it's very long. Can you think about how that helps them eat?
let's do some brainstorming. If you want to type in a phrase, what, how that specifically helps them eat, that yes, they can stick their tongue in the hole, but how else are they going to be using their tongue? I have had that happen as well, Nicole. <laughs> that really shows you how sticky they are then. That's hilarious. So imagine if you're a woodpecker with a four inch long tongue and you're about four inches high, <laughs> you have a small hole in the tree, the cavity. And if you had a short tongue, you would only get one bug each time you're drilling into the hole. But if you have a long tongue, they can, they stick it in and around and around in a circle all over the place to get as much as they can. They reach very, very far into the tree, sometimes continuing to scrape with their claws or scrape with their bill down in a downwards motion to scrape away at those first layers of bark in order to get even more bugs. So they are just on a hunt constantly using their awesome body adaptations to help them get food. Perfect, so I'm gonna leave this slide up, but does anybody have any questions right now that they're wondering from what we've talked about, about the adaptations and habitat of our woodpeckers? And if not, I will just move right along. All right, I'll move on. <laughs> we'll just keep it on this one then. So as we go to identify our group of birds, remember we're in the Picidae family. So that's easy to narrow it down. There's literally only one family to choose from. Think about where this bird lives. So in, in each bird that we'll go through um, after this, I'll tell you where in, the, in North America it usually hangs out try to notice what the colors and the patterns are. What you might find when we're looking at the woodpeckers today is that so many of them look very similar to each other. Try to get a good look at the whole body whenever possible. Make a note of those noticeable colors and patterns you're seeing. And can you tell if it's male, female, if it's juvenile? And what's it doing? Is it in flight? Many woodpeckers won't be in flight for a very long time during their day. They're going to be mostly in the trees during their day. Some woodpeckers spend more time on the ground than in trees. And if they're in a tree, you might be able to narrow it down to something else. <laughs> if you do have a field guide, um, and you want to get to know some of these woodpeckers better, I would go grab that now. Any field guide will help. If you have Merlin, it's nice to have your range downloaded for where you live. But um, if you don't download all of North America, which is a huge packet, um, you won't see all of the woodpeckers on the app. And I see a really good question. Um, is there a reason that most woodpeckers tend to have black and white? with red highlights. I don't know the question either, but I have been wondering since I've been constantly thinking about woodpeckers lately is that I wonder if that's an evolutionary adaptation, that they are all of the same family and that they would have similar plumage coloring based on that. What do you guys think? <laughs> that's a really good question. So I think Kelsey will probably get back to us. Let's move to the first woodpecker. This is my, one of my other favorites. I guess I can't, I can't really pick more than one. This is an unmistakable woodpecker as an adult. On the top is a picture of an adult male. On the bottom is a juvenile. 
So this is a resident of Eastern and Central US. Um, slightly, it's a medium common bird um, in terms of these woodpeckers. We have some woodpeckers that are pretty rare and some that are extremely common. Uh, these are one of the four woodpecker species known to store food. So they caches of food and they remember where they were kept. They remember where, where that food was, was stored at. And these birds are also great at snatching prey from the sky, kind of like a flycatcher. So they're good at swooping and swarring and they can catch bugs out of the sky. Not a lot of woodpeckers are, are good at that because like I said, they have all these amazing adaptations to be on a tree for a long period of time, drumming, drumming, drumming. This is the red-headed woodpecker. Good job. Named for its red head, but look at how red this red head is compared to the red that we'll see on some other woodpeckers. I also want to say that um, this bird holds a special place in my heart because I was able to see a lot of these working at the Shadron State Park Banding Station in Western Nebraska. Um, Banding 101 is our webinar for next week. And if you guys would like to learn more about the banding process, some really cool banding photos and some cool stories, I'm sure, tune in because Colin, who is our banding coordinator, will be doing that one next week. So these pictures were taken by um, a gentleman who works for Nebraska Land Magazine, and this article actually just came out a couple days ago if you wanted to go check out what's going on with redheaded woodpeckers in Nebraska. <laughs> Zach, do you think this is Woody the Woodpecker or another one that we'll see in a little bit? I'll have to ask you again at the end. All right, here's our second woodpecker. We have a male on the top and a female on the bottom. This is a small, quiet woodpecker. This is more northern North America, so a lot of Canada and the Western Mountains. This would live in the Rocky Mountains for sure. This is an insectivore. It chips sideways at the bark with its bill to scrape away at the tree and get the insects out. So it's really good at scraping with its beak. And it has a unique toe arrangement from other woodpeckers. If you look closely, you may only count three toes, <laughs> which gives it its name. This is our American three-toed woodpecker. Yep, so I did see a couple three-toads as the answers, but I did see some downies as well, and I completely see why you'd be confused by that. That's where we get tricky with the identification of these woodpeckers and what we're going to be looking for, especially reading through your field guide and learning about the woodpeckers that live and where you're looking for them. For example, this woodpecker on the bottom is in the Rocky Mountain region, and she has less barring on her wings, so it's more solid black, than the birds you would see more north or more east. One way you can tell that it, it's a male American three-toed woodpecker is of course by that pretty yellow cap on the top of their head. I've personally never seen this bird. They're small and quiet. All right, do you think that uh, this is two pictures of the same species or two pictures of two different species? Good, I see mostly two different woodpeckers is mostly the answer I'm seeing. Awesome, awesome. So, and I see, I have another question. My follow-up is, are these males or females or we don't know? Yep. Very good. These are males of two different species. This is our downy woodpecker on top and our hairy woodpecker on the bottom. So they look almost exactly alike. Now when comparing two pictures of a still bird 
of just two random birds of these species, you might be finding lots and lots of differences amongst their plumage. The colors on, you know, the wing bars on the downy above are way more prominent than the one below. But these things are, when you're looking at this bird from far away and you just hear a chatter, you hear a drumming and you look up, see a bird for a second, it is tough to tell which one that you have seen because they're very, very similar and they occupy almost the exact same habitat. The downy is the most common or one of the most common. I'm not sure if we have a complete census on how many downy woodpeckers there are. They are an insectivore and our hairy is also an insectivore. But where you can really tell the difference between the two is if you, like if you put your thumb up to the screen right now and measured the length of the hairy woodpecker's bill, it's almost the same length as his head. But the downy has a tiny bill. It is way smaller than the size of his head. I'd say that's about 25% of the size of his head. So that is my favorite way to tell the difference. I'll also say that hairy woodpeckers are bigger, but not by much. And if you're seeing one or the other, it's hard to tell, well, is that big or a small bird? So that is how to tell the difference between a downy and a hairy woodpecker. Now, these are two of the most common woodpeckers that you'd see almost anywhere in America, almost. <laughs> Certain areas of the coasts are gonna have some cool woodpeckers too, and these might be a little less common. The bill difference is really big, yes. Yeah. So the males will have that red patch. It's just straight on the back of their head. So here we have again is one patch of color and black and white checkered kind of patterns on its body. The females do not have that red patch, but they look exactly the same other than that. All right, here is our third bird of the day. So this bird also lives in the Western mountains. Um, in Colorado, you might find them in open ponderosa pine forests. They're going to drill holes in pretty much only coniferous trees. You would not find this bird in a deciduous tree because they're looking to feed on sap, which there's a huge content of sap in coniferous trees. The male and female, which are pictured here, the males on top, they were originally thought to be different species. And to me, the one on bottom actually looks way more like a northern flicker type of woodpecker. I would uh, also think these look way different. Okay, we've got some, I see some correct answers. This is our first sap sucker of the day. So I mentioned that these are still considered woodpeckers, but they eat more sap than insects. So they've got a different name. This is named after someone named Williamson. <laughs> I do think the male is quite pretty. They've got a greenish back, a reddish throat, a yellow belly, and beautiful wing bars, and that masking on the eyes too. So I think that's a gorgeous bird. And then the female is very, very different. A little bit like the difference between a red wing blackbird, male and female. Like they just look like different birds. Good job. I'm gonna kind of quickly go through the rest of these just because I'm getting a little low on time and I wanna be able to let you all out at, right at noon. So anybody know this bird here? I'm gonna show one picture and then I'm gonna show some others. Oh, good question. And yes, they still peck the wood, even if you're a sap sucker. They still have those same adaptations in their skull, their tongue, their feet, their tails to, to help that. And they'll have to get into the middle of the tree in order to lick the sap up. Thanks, Kelsey. Okay, I have some great answers and I thought I was gonna stump you on this one <laughs> because this one stumped me for a really long time. So let's say you only saw this bird from this angle here. Things I notice is a red, a reddish head, but it to me looks more orange than the red-headed woodpecker we first saw. Here's another picture of, I believe that's a female on top and the males on the bottom. 
they look pretty similar, but you might notice a little bit of difference in the top of their heads. So this is the red-bellied woodpecker. This is a pretty common woodpecker. I grew up in eastern Nebraska, and this was the most common woodpecker I would see. They have a rolling, very loud call. Um, if I had extra time, I would play some calls for you. But if you guys go to allaboutbirds.org or go on your Merlin app, you can hear some of these calls. They're really loud, too. <laughs> the males do have a longer tongue than the females, which it could do a lot of things. One suggestion is that having, if you're in a breeding pair, which we call a male and female bird that are, are together raising their young, if you have one parent that has a tongue of certain length, one parent with a tongue of another length, and they find food by sticking it in those holes and swirling it all around, it might help to have, be able to have two parents that can go to different sized holes and go to different areas to gather more food little interesting fact about our red bellies. All right, there, there it is again. Here's another pretty green woodpecker. I also love this one and have never seen it in the wild. This bird forages like a flycatcher, kind of like our red-headed blackbird, red-headed woodpecker. And it flies a little bit like a crow. So I have a picture of this one in flight. Um, it is hard to see what colors you're looking at from underneath. Oftentimes it can be with many birds, but you might recognize it by that red belly, the red chin, and the shiny bill. <laughs> this bird mostly lives in the U.S., but it actually was spotted in Nebraska for the first time ever this year. Um, it was spotted at Shram Nature Center, which was pr probably the best place for it to be because it lived there for several weeks and all of the crazy birders in Nebraska were able to come out to that area and find the Lewis's woodpecker. Unfortunately, this is about seven hours from where I live, so I did not get to see the Lewis's woodpecker, but they are so gorgeous and they're actually named after Meriwether Lewis. I'm positive he's not the first person that saw that bird, but he did on his, on his famous journey. <laughs> This is our Lewis's woodpecker. I think I, I gave the name away on that one. <laughs> All right, here is another woodpecker. This is another pretty common resident throughout North America. They have a really loud call. It's more a chirp. I haven't mentioned yet that woodpeckers don't have songs like a lot of other birds and many other passerines. They they communicate through chirps and drumming, and each species has a different drumming pattern and a different chirping pattern. Great. These are a big woodpecker, and this is one of them that actually prefers to live on the ground. At our banding station in Shadron, we don't catch a ton of these because they don't fly into the nets because the nets don't reach the ground. Um, occasionally they will, and it's very, very fun to catch these birds because especially in the central United States, you might see a yellow northern flicker, which this one is. You guys have totally got it. Or you might see the orange, sorry, the red. So this is either called being yellow shafted or red shafted. Um, the red shafted are more on the western side of North America, while our yellow shafted are more on the east. What do you think happens in the middle, <laughs> in the central United States, or through our central flyway, through our Great Plains states? What do you think those birds look like? Red? Yellow? Yep, both. So they have, it's called being an intergrade. So you're a yellow shafted and a red shafted at the same time. It's just like being a hybrid. But these are, these are um, all the same species. These are not different birds hybridizing. But when a yellow gets with the red, it makes orange. <laughs> kind of makes sense to me. And they are just absolutely gorgeous. They're pretty common, but they have such, such pretty coloring to me. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Now I have about nine minutes left. So what I want to do is go through the other woodpeckers in North America. If you know these ones, type them out 
<laughs> very fast. <laughs> Um, cause I'm going to go through these pretty quick, but these, um, I have six on this slide and three on the next slide that all belong to the Western side of North America. Now you're not going to find these birds from Colorado to California, from Mexico to Canada, no matter what, but they might have limited ranges. Some of these birds habitats have been, um, have shrunk over time as well. So they don't have really, really e extreme long ranges. Here again, we see only one standing out as a brown woodpecker, while the others all have red on their heads and they all have black and white on their bodies. Yeah, so we've got an acorn woodpecker, <laughs> we've got a red nape sucker, Nuttles woodpecker, Arizona woodpecker, that's the brown one. And yes, it mostly does just live in Arizona and south to Mexico, the red breasted sap sucker, and our ladder backed woodpe woodpecker. To me, the Natal's woodpecker and ladder-backed look very similar. And I would, need, I would need some help, I think. I don't, this would be tough on your own. <laughs> here's our other three for the Western side. So here's a bird on a cactus, hmm. A bird, the bird below looks like one we just spoke about. And we've got a unique, unique, uh, feather patterning, patterning on the one on the right. <laughs> this is our Gila woodpecker, our white-headed woodpecker with a fitting name, and a gilded flicker. Gilded flickers and northern flickers do sometimes hybridize, but for now they're still considered separate species. Okay, perfect. If you live in the central states and we haven't covered your woodpeckers yet, here are the remaining three. I want to see if anybody knows these off the top of their head. If not, that's of course fine. As I look through these, I just am comparing the different coloring. While I can tell they're all woodpeckers based on the shape of their body, the way they're sitting on the tree, the length of their bill, those patterns are similar yet different enough to really get your eyes finding all these different parts of their body to try to identify them. Nice work. We have a black-backed woodpecker, a yellow-bellied sapsucker, and a golden-fronted woodpecker. <laughs> As we get into these two, you just start noticing how similar all of the names are. Most of these are named by some color on their body, while some are named from a, a human who discovered them or whatever, or did scientific research on them. Um, but of our 25 or so woodpecker species, there's sapsuckers, woodpeckers, there's goldens, yellows, <laughs> blacks, reds. They've all got bellies. It's pretty crazy. Okay, let's move on to two Eastern birds. I had to talk about this one at the very end. I have not ever seen this bird in real life either. It's pretty sad. I think a lot of you would know the bird on the left, but what's the bird on the right? It's actually our only endangered woodpecker. The one on the, the picture on the right, it actually doesn't have the color that is listed in its name. Oh, Michelle got it. Yep, and I think that's pronounced red cockaded woodpecker. I have no clue, but you did spell it completely correct. That's our pileated woodpecker on the left, our red cockaded woodpecker on the right. Okay, perfect. Let's talk about bringing woodpeckers, um, attracting them to you. And let's also talk about what happens when they cause damage to something that is yours. <laughs> so we did talk about before that if you're trying to feed woodpeckers, um, it's kind of hard to just collect a bunch of bugs and feed them to the woodpeckers, but they will eat seed. Um, they like suet, they might eat nuts, and they might go visit um, nectar or jelly feeders that are meant for hummingbirds and orioles because they're used to licking up that juicy stuff and with all of the water and the sugars in it. 
If you're trying to distract a woodpecker, however, if you look on the right, this is a hilarious solution. Um, I think it has worked for some people, but I wouldn't say this is a scientifically proven solution. This is a basically a paper or a cardboard woodpecker colored to look like a pileated woodpecker to distract them from drumming on these poles if a woodpecker is already there. This is really something they have tried. So if you're having an issue with woodpeckers pecking on your house, I would say try that. Other than that, I really don't know. <laughs> it's hard to distract wildlife, or I mean, by distracting them, I mean getting them away from you. Getting them away from your habitat. You don't really want holes in your house, but the woodpeckers are gonna try to do that. It's like a dog with a toy. It's gonna chew the toy. It's what a dog does. So that's what I have to say about that. I'm sure we could do some more research and find out some other tools. As I was researching for this presentation, I found a ton of cutouts for, for something like this, where you just print it off and then color it out, staple it, nail it, tape it to your, the utility pole sort of thing. Okay, I'd like to talk a little bit about conservation of our woodpeckers. So I mentioned that the one endangered species of the woodpeckers is the red cockaded woodpecker. Um, they are facing local extinction in some areas, which just means that while their full populations across North America, some are doing well, some are doing so badly that it looks like they won't ever live in that area again. So that's one of the woodpeckers of the most concern conservationally. I talked earlier about keeping our dead trees standing. There is life in these trees as much as possible and to limit pesticide use as much as possible as well. Now, of course, um, us personally, we don't have a lot of control over the pesticides that are used commercially, but keeping awareness that those pesticides do harm not only our woodpeckers, but lots of animals. Um, a lot of birds love insects. So those are, those are just two things of conservation concern that we can, that we can do to help these woodpeckers. All right, folks. So that wraps it up for our webinar today. I would love to stay on. I can stay on for as long as you want to learn more about woodpeckers, but if you need to get off the, off the Zoom, that's totally fine. I mentioned next week is birding, bird banding 101, <laughs> bird banding 101. So those, that event should be up on Facebook. I will send out uh, an email today to everybody that attended. Um, with a link to the YouTube presentation and hopefully a link for next week's webinar too, if I have that ready. So I will try to do that and I'll stay on for any other questions. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much.